Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon, morning, or evening to you. Welcome to this edition of A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is our daily journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time, and that's where you come in. It's your questions on the Bible. Uh, Any question you have about the Bible from Genesis to Revelation on the table here. Maybe it's a favorite verse you'd like to get to know in a little bit more up close and personal way. Maybe it's a puzzling passage uh, where you could use some clarity. Uh, We'd love to be able to explore any part of the Word of God with you. Uh, It is your questions that determine exactly where we go on this journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. If you'd like to find out how to apply God's Word to your life, maybe even uh, give a reason for the hope that is within you to skeptics and non-believers these days, we're all over those kind of questions. Also, uh, if you'd like to talk about the events of the day, even the events of tomorrow through biblical prophecy, we'd uh, love to be able to explore that with you too. So uh, wherever we go on uh, the broadcast, entirely up to you. Uh, For the next few minutes, we'll be exploring that uh, by uh, tackling your questions. I'm joined here by my right-hand man, protege, all-around good guy, Sean Richards. Sean, how can people get their questions to us? Well, if you'd like to email us, questionsforhope at gmail.com is where you can send them. Also note that if you want that spelled out, we'll have it on our website, calvarychristianfellowship.com. If you click on the Watch Live tab, you'll be able to not only send us uh, your email questions through the proper spelling, but also at the right-hand side of the screen, you'll be sent to well, basically an opportunity to engage with us live and on the air. Uh, As of the broadcast we're currently doing today, we're experiencing a bit of technical difficulties, but this will be uploaded after the fact, so no worries there long term, but short, just keep us in prayer that we can get this figured out. Um, Note as well, if you want to join us on social media, YouTube is a reason for hope, and Facebook is Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. Uh, If you want to give us a like or subscribe there, the advantage advantage is you'll be notified when we are going live. The disadvantage, though, is that we have had a very fluctuating relationship as to when or why our posts are taken down. So if, like this situation, we're uh, not broadcasting, but we don't tell you in advance as to why, that will, of course, still be uh, amended by our website being available for you, which is, once again, C-A-L-V-A-R-Y, ChristianFellowship.com. Click on the Watch Live tab, and you can join us there. Uh, I'm going to continue to do a mad scramble here, but uh, why don't we start off with the word of prayer and see where the Lord takes the time we have to be available. Yeah, Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity to be able to uh, answer the questions we have received here today. And Lord, uh, we don't know uh, the whys or the wherefores, but uh, you do, and we believe that you are in charge of all these things. Even uh, technical malfunctions, you can work together for your glory. So we pray that we would focus in on sharing your word, one question of the heart at a time, as you've called us to do. We pray for the filling and anointing of your Holy Spirit, that we might be able to do this in a way that honors and glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. That is true. Now, uh, again, starting with the questions that we've received in advance and prepared for just such an occasion, um, we always enjoy uh, revisiting contradictions every now and again, because you'll hear them both now and again, and again. Uh, The contradiction is the claim that Herod apparently thought that Jesus was John the Baptist, but that is contradicted in the gospel accounts. In Matthew 14, 1 through 2, and in Mark 6, 16, he did believe that Jesus was John the Baptist. But in Luke chapter 9 and verse 9, he did not think that Jesus was John the Baptist. Now, of course, when we are given these sort of claims, and Luke will obviously be the odd man out, so let's see if it in fact denies that. But the key issue in all of this is most of the people who bring up these fancy multi-syllable words, contradiction, don't even know what a contradiction is. A contradiction is a violation of the second formal law of logic that A does not equal non-A. Two things in the same way and in the same sense can't both be true and cancel each other out at the same time. So if we have in Luke 9.9, apparently, a 
objective and direct denial that Herod, specifically the Herod that was around during the time and the uh, demise of John the Baptist, right. did not made the affirmative state or rather the negative statement that Jesus was not John the Baptist risen from the dead. Well, then there's a rumor going around that has conflicting information, which even in of itself isn't a contradiction. You can rep- uh, record conflicting reports and the issue is on the part of the reporter. We know all about that today. But if on the other hand, the Bible makes a definitive statement that Herod made this claim and in another place says that Herod did not make this claim or made the opposite claim, we'd have a problem. What does Luke 9 9 actually say? Well, uh, always good to go to the direct text. Uh, it says, uh, Now Herod the Tetrarch, this is verse 7, heard of all that was done by him, Jesus, and was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John, I've beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. So is there anything in that text that denies Herod having the opinion? No, not at all. In fact, it mentions that this was a phrase going about, and Matthew and Mark both affirm he adopted this point too, uh, one in particular because of a guilty conscience, and it goes on to explain why. But do we have any conflict of fundamental information that a claim was made concerning Jesus, that he was John the Baptist risen from the dead? We don't believe that. Jesus doesn't believe that. John the Baptist certainly didn't believe that. But at some point, is it impossible to read Luke chapter 9 and say that Herod couldn't have also adopted that view, since it says in the text in line with the other two texts they gave for us, that this was the belief of some. Yeah, uh, there, there, there's absolutely no reason uh, to come to that conclusion. And this is another insight into contradictions. I love the fact that uh, we on this broadcast point out what a contradiction really is, uh, that a thing can't be A and non-A at the same time, uh, that in this case uh, you would have to have a direct statement from Herod saying, oh, I know for sure that Jesus isn't John the Baptist risen from the dead. And another statement where Herod is saying, yes, I believe that uh, he is uh, John the Baptist risen from the dead. In the same uh, incident, the same flow of when the ministry of Jesus was taking place. We simply don't have that here. And I think it points out an important thing about people that uh, drop the, oh, the Bible contradicts itself card. More often than not, what you're dealing with is not a fault or a flaw with the Bible, but rather, wouldn't you say, Sean, a fault or flaw in an individual's interpretation of a particular passage in the Bible. Which, again, isn't even a dismissal on its own. You People make the regard, oh, well, the book is is just such a subjective way of communicating truth because you have to interpret the information in the book. You have an interpretation, they have an interpretation. How do we know which is the right one? I will say that this is the right one and that these two passages conflict with each other. But notice that the individual who's playing that game now has to play by their rules. And I can say, well, since your interpretation is that the Bible is invalid and that's just your interpretation, that it bears no way to me as an individual, because I can interpret two texts to be completely harmonious, like we did using the laws of the English language and grammar and information and logic. So it's kind of (laughs) shooting yourself in the foot to even go down that path. If you play by rules that make it meaningless and then say the meaning conflicts with each other, the fact that the meanings conflict with each other is meaningless. If you eliminate logic as a rule and then hold it to a logical standard, it means nothing. Yeah. But if, on the other hand, you approach the Bible and say, no, there is such a thing as a right and wrong interpretation and a right and wrong source of information. If you say that the Bible contradicts itself, you're saying that it needs to be consistent in the information. Make sure that the person making the claim plays by those rules, too. Because usually, and this is uh, 90 eight times out of a hundred, that they either haven't taken the time to read the passage for themselves, are taking the word of someone else, or just like throwing around contradiction without an example, because it puts them in the intellectually superior camp. We don't play by that game. We want to make sure that what we read is not only trustworthy, but the people challenging it 
are consistent, are honest, just like we would be if we were giving them information about it. Yeah, uh, and this kind of raises a, uh, a kind of a dovetailing question. Interaction uh, before the broadcast on Twitter, uh, a fellow uh, made the assertion uh, that uh, the idea of hell is strictly a New Testament idea, that it wasn't put forth at all in the Old Testament. That was his first claim. Great. And then the second claim that he made was that any reference we find in the Old Testament to hell is borrowing and lifting directly from Zoroastrianism. In other words, Isaiah chapter 66, which specifically speaks about the final destination of the ungodly, this person says is uh, clear cutting and pasting from the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism. How would we respond to that? Well, again, if you heard this on Twitter, I think that's a first strike for reliability, but let's... No, this is an interaction on Twitter. This is what this person's asserting on Twitter. Yes, yeah. and that's, uh, again, a mark against them. But if, on the other hand, someone's allowed to say things and make references to multi-syllable words like Zoroastrianism, that's all well and good, but can you back up your claim? Can you show me where that interaction chapter and verse took place? Can you maybe, for instance, and this is, uh, I, again, not to take too much of an intellectual aside, I did a interactive video on Zoroastrianism. I read through their primary sources and a little bit into the history surrounding it. So Zor if someone wants to find out what Zoroastrianism actually teaches, you just look up Zoroastrianism. They'll have their text listed out for you. No, and you but can where, just... where can they get a hold of the video that you made on that? Oh, um, on YouTube, it would be Shady Oak Ministries, okay. and I give my citations in the description. Okay. But the point being made is this. In a nutshell, Zoroastrianism, there's a Persian bent usually to it, but there's been other versions, some Greek, some, um, you know, not uh, Iranian, because that is Persian, but also uh, extended Middle Eastern perspectives, even some going as far as Egypt, where the stories have been skewed a little bit, so we don't actually know what it is. And the reason for that, especially in India, is because Zoroastrianism was the primary belief of a certain individual by the name of Cyrus the Great, or Darius the Mede, and his culture where essentially they narrowed down their concerns, not their awareness, but their concerns to two main gods. Ahriman, who is the evil god, the chief demon, and Ormazd, and don't ask me to spell it because I can never figure out where the Z and the D is in a, the matter of it. Persian's funny. Yeah. But uh, he's the good god. He's a specifically ethnocentric Persian deity that wants his people and his ethnicity to ultimately be the inheritors of this world. And they usually have three different versions of the story. Either and this is the one thing they all have in common. When Araman, the chief demon, created everything, Ormazd wanted to make it serve a purpose, but Araman had the right to decide what to do with his stuff, so there's a conflict between them. When he created the universe from materials, I won't explain what, uh, the conflict is essentially a 4,000-year cycle between them where Ormazd is the upper hand, their level, Araman has the upper hand, and then the cycle continues. Others say that it was a definitive moment in history where Araman created the world, and Ormazd is slowly taking it over to rule over it forever. And by the way, note that because that actually didn't come into being until the uh, 6th century BC, and you know who were interacting with the Persians around that time, but I digress. The other interesting aspect to this story is, again, the belief of many gods, and they're just focusing on these two, but it's a dualistic theology, and if you want to know Zoroastrianism and function, just look at Star Wars. The goodness of the world is there's the dark and there's the light. Some right. choose the dark, like Araman, some choose the light, like Ormazd. You want to be on the light because they're generally seen as the good guys, but in terms of theology, and truth, you can't really say that Ormazd has more of a right to be worshipped than Araman because they're both gods. In fact, Araman has more of a right because he created everything. Ormazd didn't. That aside. So the bad god created everything. Yeah, and I won't tell you how, but yeah. uh, it's kind of yeah. kind of yucky. The point being made is this: in the account, the Persians are hoping for this messianic kingdom. This is the most popular form of how it's practiced today. And interestingly enough, I alluded to this earlier. That view only came into writing when the Jews, who were living in Babylon at the time, 
were then taken under the custody of Cyrus the Great when he conquered Babylon in the 6th century BC. And this was, of course, recorded for us in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, or the end of chapter 5 as well. But what's interesting about that and noting the point, people say, oh, Judaism borrowed from Zoroastrianism in this messianic view. Well, why do you say that? Well, because we have temples to Zoroastrianism that predate Judaism, which is misleading. The people either are assuming too much about Zoroastrianism being a linear record, which we can prove within two minutes, or the existence of temples that have the zodiac, which are also included, granted, in Zoroastrian worship, are in existence then. That's the only way they link the two. The argument is because Zoroastrianism makes this claim and Judaism makes this claim, because Zoroastrianism as a concept is older. We don't know what they taught before this, and this is where the third point's going to be key. We know what they taught before this, but we do know when they interacted with the Jews, suddenly it started to sound a little bit more Jewishy, and this is incredibly common. When you look at Greek paganism or Roman paganism, the cult of Mithras was a copy and paste borrowing of the accounts of Jesus, and we know why and when because it postdates Christianity. We so, know when the Greeks were interacting with Christians. So it kind of gets into the which came first, the chicken or the egg, kind of an argument. And we can know for certain, because guess what happened to the Zoroastrian faith? <laughs> God bless you. Uh, during around the 8th century or so AD, Islam took over Persia. And all of the faithful Zoroastrians, the people who were loyal to their culture and ethnic religion, were driven out of the land, subjugated, or forced into conversion to Islam. So they either had to abandon their faith, they had to flee their country and take their beliefs with them, right. or they had to basically allow their religion and its practices to run into disrepair and a second-class citizen status, while Muslims would then dominate both ecologically, economically, and geographically. Right. So all this time, and for 400 years, by the way, Zoroastrianism was the not dominant faith right. in Persia, where it was largely centered. Most of them were either fleeing to India, where you see vestiges of it still to this day, or were dispersed throughout Muslim lands and ultimately right. into non-existence. When they came back, that's when we start getting writing about Zoroastrianism, reflecting on the old ways before their exile. We don't even have their sacred texts before they were driven out by the Muslims 700 or 800 years, rather, excuse me, after the time of Christ and another 600 years after that when Daniel was interacting with Cyrus the Mede. Now, we have Cyrus the Mede's writings, and we know that he had some regard for this ethnic culture, but it's all guesswork, because guess who was writing the accounts of Daniel and these references to Cyrus the Mede? Either people thousands of years removed from the fact, just like with the Zoroastrian text, who could have easily have borrowed from Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or Hindu yeah. themes yeah. on the way. Yeah. Or <laughs> they're just making this stuff up. But the point being made is that when we ask, what are the actual dates? You can say Zoroastrian existed before Judaism. I raise my hand with you and say that is incredibly likely. You can even say that the worship of Ormazd and Araman as a concept existed before or at least around the time of Judaism. We do have variations of the story that would fit that cyclical battle. That's the opinion that I take and some scholars do as well. But the claim and the assertion that Judaism borrowed from Zoroastrianism or Christianity borrowed from Zoroastrianism, we don't even have to go to the Old Testament. It's verifiably false because we know when Jewish writings about the religion existed, and it is thousands of years before the time that we have anything concerning writing that we can test and verify. So it would be as if I, say I have my Bible here, if we were to compare this to the Zoroastrian claim that the idea of hell and so forth was just taken from those things, yes, it is true that there are graphic depictions of a state of torment in Armand's realm. But the point is still moot if you can't show me chapter and verse. If I were to put myself in the same camp as Zoroastrians, this would be the account of the Old Testament. 
Moses, around 1450 BC, apparently gave us the Torah, the Law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and the history that followed. But we have no evidence of it in existence anywhere, no mention of it. All their culture was taken over by outside conquest and subjugation. Now, we don't have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have the Masoretic Text, we don't have anything in regards to the Old Testament, nor the New, until around the medieval period, when after this time of exile by the Romans and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and so forth were eventually cultivated into Europe, they were able to write their Bibles for the first time. Now, if that were the case... It would not the, be a real reliable text. I, no. would not, yeah. I would not buy it in any language, culture, or geography, and that's the point. If they depend on your ignorance of something, or if they just know enough about something to mention this obscure faith that not enough people know enough about to get the upper hand in a conversation that's either manipulative or misleading. But either way, it's not pointing you to the truth. If you know enough about Zoroastrianism, which let's be honest, very few people do, I don't even know that much, and I've at least taken the time to read some of it, the point is still moot because we don't actually know what Zoroastrianism really was in the beginning. Okay, but even granting the assumption that Zoroastrianism was a well-developed and robust religious system of that time. That never adopted any other views but its own, unilaterally. Okay. Big okay. assumptions. Okay. Why would a thoroughgoing Jewish individual like Isaiah cut and paste from a religious worldview that directly contradicts the main thesis of his book, a huge portion of which, Isaiah chapters 40 through 50, almost, devoted the idea that there's one and only one God, and that the gods of the nations are idols, they're literally nothings. Why in the world would a prophet like Isaiah then cut and paste from a text that was devoted to the worship of at least two gods and maybe more? Well, I'd have to assume that he either was trying to start his own cult, that he was deliberately misleading his audience, or that Isaiah himself didn't know anything about his own belief system and got some things mistaken. But notice, I have to make all these assumptions, not from the text, not from his culture, not from his background, not from his character, not from the information he presents, and not even in the information written concerning him and his mentions of a judgment in the hereafter, as well as Daniel, as well as Genesis, as well as the Psalms, and so forth. So people who say that uh, the Old Testament prophets uh, liberal, literal, liberally cut and pasted and borrowed from other religious texts and other religious concepts and sort of uh, tossed them all on a wearing blender and gave us uh, what we know as the message of the Bible today— it simply doesn't stack up to the facts on the ground. No, you need to establish if there's an exchange of ideas, first of all, the means— you have the ability to access these informa this uh, information, and we know that the uh, Jews had no interactions with the Persians, which Zoroastrianism owes its roots and foundations into this day, until the time of Daniel, and well into the time of Daniel. So note that first as a challenge, since we have plenty of doctrine in Judaism mentioning hell and final judgment before Daniel's time and after, right. that are very different from Zoroastrianism, which you can check on your own. So the biggie would be, how do we explain Isaiah, who wrote well before the time of interaction between the Jews and the Persians, liberally borrowing from a Persian religion when there was no cultural interaction between them, or very limited cultural interaction uh, between them, at least as far as the Medes and the Persians were concerned. Babylonians had their own pantheon of gods uh, that they worshipped, that the Jews interacted with, obviously. And they didn't uh, have interactions with Babylon until Hezekiah. Yeah. So uh, in, in order to make that system work... Means, motive, opportunity. Do you have the interaction? Not until Judaism's well established. Do you have a motive? Not if you know even a smidgen of Jewish culture. Do they have the opportunity? Not until Judaism has already been established. And the smidgen of Jewish culture was after they were sent into Babylonian exile, the idea of syncretism, the idea of the coexist bumper sticker mentality, that all religious uh, perspectives are leading to that one great ocean, which is God. That would have been something that would probably get you stoned if you tried to promote that. 
in Israel at that time. You can reference that not only before in the writings of the Old Testament prophets, like you mentioned with Isaiah, but you can also check afterwards, because if there was ever a time where you could go along to get along in Jewish culture, it would have been not just the Persian period, they were pretty tolerant as far as other religions were concerned, if you discount the incident with Haman, that was different. But uh, don't you think Judas Maccabeus might have had an exactly. opportunity to uh, maybe fudge the details about and, Jupiter? <laughs> and, and, and what we're talking about here was the uh, the period of time, it's predicted in the book of Daniel, but is described in, say, the apocryphal book of Maccabees, where uh, Israel was taken over by the Greeks, and one Greek in particular, ruler, fellow by name by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, wanted to wipe out Judaism and institute Greek paganism as the only religion that would be practiced in his territory. Uh, among other things that this Antiochus Epiphanes did was if he found out that a uh, family had circumcised a child, he would have the mother and the child literally nailed to a wall as an example to other people not to do such a thing. He took a statue of Zeus and he offered it in uh, a sacrifice to it in the temple, a uh, foreshadowing of uh, the ultimate abomination that causes desolation that the Antichrist is going to do someday. But uh, the idea behind all that was that he did find some Jews that were willing to go along to get along, but the vast majority of the Jews said, no way. They formed a guerrilla war campaign against him, and um, in, uh, in an amazing set of circumstances, ended up driving out the Greeks, not because they didn't like Greek culture, not because they didn't like Greek economics, but because they found Greek religion and compromising with this religion completely and totally abhorrent to their sensibilities, correct? Correct. So before the time of Zoroastrianism's not only existence, but any interaction with Judaism, we have writings that would directly conflict with the idea that Jews would be syncretistic about it, at least the faithful Jews. After the time of Zoroastrianism and their time in Persia where exchanges could have taken place, it was the last time that Jews would have ever have considered adopting views other than their own into their religion. And we see this continuing all the way to and beyond the time of Jesus. Even to this day, you see them stubbornly holding to and keeping themselves apart from any Gentile beliefs apart from the traditions handed down to them by their rabbis. Hasn't kept them from error, but it has kept them from the assumptions this individual had to make. So you, you could uh, say a lot of things about uh, Jewish thought, particularly during the time of the writing of the Bible, but one of them, what, wouldn't it be that the uh, author's uh, uh, you know, folded, uh, pasted, and mutilated uh, concepts from other religions and created their own. Not if you know anything about the history surrounding Jewish culture and religion, not if you know anything about the beliefs of Zoroastrianism, basically not if you know things. If uh, that, of course, is still a requirement on the internet, we'll see. Yep. But uh, I'm being, of course, facetious. Yeah, okay. Well, interesting interaction uh, that we had beforehand. So the, uh, the objections were that uh, the Zoroastrians didn't worship idols, did they? Yes, they did. They specifically focus on Ormazd, or Arumazda, as they'll one day call him, in order to glorify themselves as a Persian nationality. But if we're going to say, well, they didn't uh, set up altars and idols, uh, what do you think they had in those temples? They are very much prolific. And if you ever go to uh, Persian festivals and so forth, the eagles and sprouts and stuff, these are all pagan images meant to represent various aspects of Ormazd. Now, I don't know of many Persians who worship Araman, but they acknowledge him as someone who could be credited with creation, which is something that you attribute only to a god. Yeah. But uh, on it goes. There are demons, of course, that uh, buffeted Zoroaster during his times in which he was tested as a prophet of Ormazd. And, of course, uh, the trials that he went through are, interestingly enough, very reminiscent of Jesus' time. But once again, all those sources post-date Christianity by a thousand and one hundred years. So do the math. But the point being made is this, uh, the struggles in the spiritual realm, they identify many gods in most of the accounts, and they also worship specifically Ormazd through images, through temples, through rituals, and uh, sometimes in not very nice ways. So I guess the uh, moral of our story is there's people that throw things out on the internet and have no idea what they're talking about. 
let it not be said among us. Yes. So. so with that being said, feel free to check up on the homework that was done on that, and don't take my word for it, because as we saw on Twitter, that's just as dangerous. But uh, going so out... So go to Shady Oak uh, Ministries. Ministries. Dot .org. Yes, our um, Shady Oak Ministries is the YouTube channel's name. Okay, go to YouTube, Shady Oaks Ministries, if you want to okay. get up to speed on all of that. You've got a whole uh, Bible study that you put together on this. Yeah, why I don't believe Zoroastrianism. It's yeah. a part of a series. Yeah, so, so there you go. All right, um, here's a question, uh, noting from our Yeah, this cards. comes from Donna. Uh, interesting question, why did God choose the Israelites to be the chosen people? You know, have to it's, guess. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that uh, that question is usually asked with sort of a, an open-ended uh, flavor behind it. Like, uh, you know, well, did the Jews just kind of create this religion as sort of a rah-rah thing? We're the best, we're the biggest, we're the baddest, so God chose us. Uh, really, the reality that we find in the Bible is quite different, isn't it? Yeah, he literally tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6, he says, for you, this is telling them, by the way, not to worship the idols of the nations, sorry, but verse 6 says, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you, here's where that phrase comes from, to be a special people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Why? Verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for, on the contrary, you are the least of all peoples. Verse 8, here's the key, Old Testament God, by the way, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And then goes on to note that therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, the trustworthy God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So continuing with this theme of God's character being put on display, why did he choose the Jewish people? Because he's the kind of God that keeps his promises. Promises to who? Well, you go to Genesis chapter 15 and you read right. Abraham's interaction with God, where they made a covenant together in Middle Eastern style for wealthy people. I'll just summarize it by saying they walk through a red carpet together. Oh, did I say together? God walked alone, but uh, that's, yeah. that's a study in and of itself. Yeah, the Pretty promise, heavy stuff. Yeah. yeah, the promise was made that your descendants will go to a land that is not theirs and will be oppressed 400 years, and then I will call them back to this land, but not yet because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The people currently living here got some sinning to do before judgment has to come. That is the not only reason for the Canaanite wars, but also continuing on why they're the chosen people. Chosen for what purpose? To specifically fulfill the promise to Abraham that I will make you a blessing to all nations. How? Well, because of the Jewish people, right. we see this alluded to in the book of Revelation chapter 12, but most specifically pointed out in Matthew 1 and in Luke chapter 3, the fact that the Messiah, the Redeemer of all nations, not just the Jewish people, would come to this world through the ethnicity known as the Jewish people. They would bless every nation through that and the work God would do through them. Now note, because Jesus has come, does that mean that God's through with them? Read Romans chapter 11 and call me in the morning. Yeah. But the point being God made is this. God still does have a plan for the Jewish people. But note that point. What did he choose them for? Why did he choose them? And, of course, if they are chosen, what does that mean for them? It doesn't mean that they're superhuman. They certainly have more to be accountable to. We read that in Romans chapter 2 and 3. But we also acknowledge and clarify the fact that they were chosen doesn't mean because God was, you know, assessing the genes of uh, the various races and found this would be the most productive and amicable for his spiritual purposes. No, he said, I made your ancestor a promise, and I'm a God who keeps his promises. That's the point. Yeah, I just love what Deuteronomy 7 says about this. Uh, if you've ever wondered this question, there's a direct answer in the scripture. It says, for you, referring to the Jewish people, are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. 
because they're bigger, they're badder, they're smarter, they're richer. No, it says, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you're more in number than any other people, for you're the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because uh, he would keep his oath, which he swore to your fathers, the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations to those who love him and keeps his commandments. Why did he choose the Jewish people? Because he's faithful to his promises. Not because the Jewish people were any great shakes, but because God used the Jewish people and their connection to Abraham to demonstrate to this world the greatness and the glory and the compassion and the faithfulness of God. And if you're wondering why we read that passage twice, it's because it is the answer. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Adam who wants to know, was Judas condemned in eternity for hanging himself and betraying Jesus? I think there's a real important issue that this brings up, yeah. not just with Judas, but with anyone who is ultimately in hell. Are they condemned by God, separated from him forever. That's the definition of hell, by the way, not to this macabre, you know, nine circles written by Dante Alighieri in the Divine Comedy in the Middle Ages. We're talking about what the scriptures actually tell us about the state of conscious torment, not torture, but torment, an internal state of anguish as a result of being deprived from a soul's source of life, God. What is ultimately what warrants that. Well, if you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, it's laid out for us in a very plain yeah, language. Verse 18 says, He who believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may clearly be seen they've been done in God. So what is the difference between a person who's going to heaven and one who's not? Is it moral excellence? Is it religious fidelity? Is it uh, having a, uh, uh, a heroic resume? What, what gets you in and what keeps you out? What you do with Jesus, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you believe in him, or do you reject him? That's the whole issue. So whatever Judas did on top of that, that certainly made his ultimate refusal of Jesus all the more clear. But we need to shy away from this mindset that's essentially reverse legalism. If I do certain sins, they certainly have immediate consequences that can be worse than others. But all sin is rebellion against God, and the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 says this. Yeah. So if I'm noting this point, what is death? It's separation from life. What is eternal life? Jesus said in John 17 and verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, right. the only true God, yeah. and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Yeah. So literally, we're told the status and the means by which we achieve that status. It's a gift given to us because of our belief in Jesus. If it's because you sin less, if I'm going to take an honest assessment of my life, I've probably invalidated myself ten times over without even knowing it. Yeah, but yeah. if, on the other hand, what Jesus did on the cross, and we talked about this on Sunday, uh, the whole point of emphasis is if anyone could accomplish it infinite times over, it would be the only one who's ever done it, their lives right in history. What Judas did is, of course horrible, and much like every other sin in this world, it deserves the wrath of God. But Jesus went to the cross for Judas as much as you and me. That's why when the gospel accounts in the epistles reflecting on them say that Jesus is not only our propitiation for our sins, not ours atoning only, sacrifice, yeah. but for the whole world also, that it makes a point of emphasis that Jesus is the ransom, the sacrifice for right. the world, right. but especially for the elect, those who choose it. So noting that point, I benefit from these things by receiving them, but Jesus died even for those who rejected him. Now, that's uncomfortable for a lot of people, but that's only because you diminish the character of God. Yeah. If I only think in terms of, well, what's the most efficient use of my time and energy? No, Jesus didn't come to this world to be efficient. He came to do the will of his Father, to right. reveal his character and nature, right. who, as I recall in Ezekiel, Old Testament, 33 and verse 11, does not delight in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. If Jesus only died for certain people that had hope, 
well, let's just take those last two words. Did we have hope? Would Ephesians 2, 8 through, or 1 through 3 make the point that, well, you guys were pretty bad off, but Jesus uh, opened the door to no, this said, religious we're system. dead in our trespasses and sins. You who are dead, yeah. present tense, yeah. ongoing reality, that yeah. you are sons of wrath. Yeah. Uh, literally comparative and almost an explicit uh, comparison between us and the nature of Belial, of Satan. So we're noting these points. If there was a way to save us apart from Jesus, if there was a sin that we could avoid doing that would result in us going to hell, God would have focused everything on that. But if, on the other hand, there was only one way to save us, whether we betrayed him or not, because, by the way, who also betrayed Jesus that night? Yeah, and that's such a fascinating set of contrasts, because you take a look at Simon Peter's track record, uh, people forget about this, but he also betrayed Jesus. He not only denied Jesus uh, three times, but one time in Jesus' hearing, correct? And cursing and swearing, so you can jot that down. Yeah. So you have Simon Peter, a man who stumbled and fell. Jesus predicted it. He would stumble, but he said, and and when you returned, strengthen your brethren. So I guess it's a hypothetical, but we could throw it out. Simon Peter returned. He was restored by Jesus. He was given the opportunity to reaffirm his love for Jesus three different times in John chapter 21. But Judas Iscariot, what was the difference? Literally what he did with that offer of mercy. Was his, was his heart broken over what he did? Yep. He did did he repent in, in terms of behavior and deeds? He tried, but uh, his efforts, of course, were empty because he, he didn't he, go to the ultimate He physically party. returned the money that he got, right? Yeah. But he, he never turned back to God. He never went to the ultimate offended party. Now you're saying, but Judas's betrayal was so much worse. Okay, let's just do a point of comparison. Judas's betrayal was prophesied, so was Peter's. Yeah. Jesus predicted it in advance. That's literally one of the definitions of prophecy. Oh, Judas betrayed Jesus for money. Peter betrayed Jesus because a little girl asked him about his accent. Yeah. Um, Judas was one of the twelve. Peter was one of the inner circle. <laughs> yeah. And yet, who was restored? It wasn't a matter of, well, that sin was so much worse. It was the fact that Judas never knew Jesus well enough to recognize he could forgive him. Yeah. And the question always comes up, could Judas have been restored if he had turned back to Christ? If is the big question, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, this is the problem you get into with hypotheticals. We have to deal with reality. The fact of the matter is Judas did not. And that's where we have to uh, leave it. Could Judas have been saved if he had turned back to Christ? Well, Anyone, I could have. <laughs> well, First uh, John chapter two and verse one says, "My little, my beloved uh, children, uh, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone, that's a broad term, anyone, you know, we, you know, remember subsets in in math. Uh, the subset is anyone. That means anyone." past, present, or future, who has ever lived, is living, or ever will live. And if anyone sins, uh, we have a, a, a advocate. advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, who's the atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, including Judas Iscariot, right? Right. And again, just as a caveat and an aside, the whole world was the one whom Jesus died for. Hebrews clarifies for us, he does not give aid to angels. Yeah. So any human being who would turn to Christ in faith, the sacrifice of Jesus would be sufficient to save them. Absolutely. But the big if is, will, will you turn to Christ in faith? Judas did not, Peter did, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't, well, he hanged himself. That's the mortal sin. No. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, we haven't done this for a while. Uh, kind of a lightning round sort of thing. We got a bunch of questions here about heaven, All right. about the reality of heaven. Let's try to go through these as quickly a- as possible. The first one, I think, is a great one. Will we be able to sin once we're in heaven? No. Uh, when we're told about our status in heaven, obviously, 
Christianity and Judaism are unique in that they don't focus a lot on uh, heaven in much detail. Most of the physical representations are given to us in Revelation 21 uh, and some parts of Isaiah, but even then that's mostly in the millennium. The point being made, though, is this. If I sin while in heaven, it's because I've willfully separated myself from God's character. But 1 Corinthians 13 and verses, uh, I believe, 9 through 12 make the point, and this is describing when that love in me is completed, the work that I will be conformed to the image of Christ will look like. I'll be like Him. I'll know just as I am known. Right Now, if I ask myself the question, will I in heaven have the kind of character that could still sin? because I, I did it before, separate from Jesus, how could I now, in perfect union and in the glory of Jesus? And this is where we need to remember what the Holy Spirit's meant to do. When he who began a good work in you, this is Philippians chapter 1, will be faithful to complete it till the day of Christ Jesus, what is that? We look at Romans chapter 8, to be conformed to the image of his Son. Right. For me to properly say, I could sin in heaven, is to say, could Jesus in his character sin, not on earth, but in heaven? And the answer is, of course, that's absurd. Yeah. So when yeah. I have that heavenly status, when I am conformed to the image of His glorious body, I also need to understand the best part of that is His character. I won't want to sin anymore, any more than Jesus would. Yeah, I love what First John chapter 3 and verses 2 and following says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as he is. And it says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. So Jesus is pure and yeah. will be like that. Pure. Yeah, we will be like him, not pure with possibility of defect. We will uh, 100% enjoy and have fellowship with God. People say, well, you know, does that mean like we're robotic? Uh, no, it just means that we're going to be able to give and receive perfect love, which sounds like a great deal for me. Here's another one. Will we recognize our loved ones when we get to heaven? Again, same passage in 1 Corinthians 13, we're told that uh, I'll know just as I am known. And if the perfection, the completion of any spiritual gift, chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians describe knowledge as one of those things. The completion of that isn't the limiting of that. That's a contradiction. Right. <laughs> if I have complete knowledge, then I'm going to be able to love and know people perfectly, just like God does. If that includes those who are in heaven, then I don't expect to be, as uh, Don Stewart yeah. oftentimes says, yeah. a bigger fool in heaven than I am on earth. And we have kind of a foreshadowing of this. You have to infer a little bit. But when people, even in a fallen sinful state, saw someone in a glorified body. The yeah, same Matthew people, chapter 17, right? Yeah, the people yeah. who were in their heavenly forms. At the least the Mount of Transfiguration, possible. when Moses and Elijah show up, How what they happened? Know? Well, they knew that those were Moses and Elijah. Now, the Apostle Peter and John and James had not seen Elijah. He would have been dead for 900 years. Moses, 1,400 years before that, or uh, in addition to that. So we need to ask the question, how did they know those two? Did Jesus explain it to them? Not in the text. They just looked at them and knew who they were. Now, if we ask, what will that be like? Did they have name tags? <laughs> I don't know. No, all we're told is that they were able to recognize Moses and Elijah. It never says that Jesus turned and explained to them. It never says that Jesus was addressing them. The only thing he was talking about with them was his exodus, interestingly enough, his departure from this world. But the point is still there. If we saw glorified people able to be identified by fallen people that they had never met, and understand who they were perfectly, then why would we think we'd be limited in two glorified people interacting with each other and saying, oh, I forgot your name, when yeah. I have the perfection, of, uh, the completion of knowledge through the Spirit? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's excellent. How about this one? Are people in heaven watching us right now? There's an inference to that in Hebrews 12, I think, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses to run this race faithfully and so forth. But the problem is the context of this is a follow-through to chapter 11, which is the Hall of Fame of Faith. Now, witnesses can go one of two ways. Either you're being witnessed... Witnessing something, yeah. Or you are witness to something. You are either recalling or you're experiencing. Now, if we're experiencing, 
that kind of witness, then that's usually referring to people in heaven. You know, my dear sainted grandma's looking down at me. Yeah. But the problem is it didn't, the previous chapter leading up to this didn't talk about all the people who are looking at you. It's calling to mind all the people who came before us. We're the witnesses and are told to live in light of that reality. I think it's more appropriate to conclude that than to, you know, as well intended as some of these TV shows may be, to present this image of people in the presence of Jesus for some reason not being interested in being with Jesus, of uh, focusing on the misery and wallowing despair we see here on the earth. Yeah. When people are in heaven, they're in the presence of Jesus, and I think, in all fairness, that's going to fully encapsulate their attention. It doesn't mean they don't care about you, but it does mean that they're now experiencing the purpose for which they were created. And, and I think that's the key point there. You know, what is going to be the focus that people are going to have in heaven? I think even Hebrews chapter 12 drops a hint in that direction when it says, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, in other words, uh, it's not that these people are watching us run our race, but we have these witnesses, these testimonies we see in Hebrews chapter 11 of a race well run, uh, if you will. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And I love this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and I sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's so fascinating to me that in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, particularly when talking about Moses and Abraham and others, that if they had paid attention to where they had come from and the conditions that they had on earth, they might have been tempted to return, but they sought a better kingdom, a lasting kingdom, a lasting homeland that God was going to provide for them. So they were always looking forward to what heaven was going to be all about. Now, when you're in heaven, what is heaven all about? I, I love the fact that you quoted uh, John 17, 3 earlier, that this is eternal life. I mean, know, oh, thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who sent. When we get to heaven, it's all going to be having, uh, about having this relationship with Jesus. And I think, you know, and, and again, this is my two cents worth. I bounce this off. You see what you think. I think that the more I focus on Jesus here on this earth, the less I worry about you because I know that Jesus can handle your life. I know I can't as much as I'd like to as your dad, but I know that Jesus has got you. And, and uh, you know, when, when I have concerns and things about people that I love and care for so much, uh, it, it's easy for me to get nervous or anxious if I'm focusing in on you. But if I focus on Jesus, I know he's got this. And, and I can't help but think that in heaven, maybe that's what's going on. You know, the writer of Hebrews says, focusing our eyes, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You know, that's the way to have peace in this life. And I can't help but think that those who are in glory, you know, maybe they are concerned about us. Maybe, oh, man, you know, I've left all these people behind. You know, they're not here yet. How are they doing? One look at Jesus, you know, will convince them that he who began a good work in them will also complete that good work in us that are still running our race here. And I don't think they worry about us. I think they worship Jesus, say, Lord, you've got this. Let's just focus in on you. Not that they don't care, but every time they care, they realize that the Lord, in fact, cares even more about them than they ever could. Yeah, and again, seeking alternatives, even when we are given examples, glimpses, really, of people reflecting on things in heaven concerning the earth, it ultimately ended the same way anyway. In Revelation chapter 6, and the fifth seal judgment takes place, the cry of the martyrs is, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you um, uh, not judge those and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Yeah. And what's the consolation? They were given white robes and told to rest. Now, it doesn't say that they right. went to the back to the earth to haunt people or something, that yeah. that's the, <laughs> the fallout of the plague. No, it's they're with Jesus. They're asking him, interestingly enough. He's the center of their attention, not, man, did you see what they did to my body? It's like, Jesus, I need some justice here. If you look at the prelude to the bold yeah. judgments, Revelation yeah. 15, yeah. they're not looking at the state of the world and saying that needs judgment. They're looking at God and saying, you're a judge, and you're going to do this right. So every time there's a reflection of something on the earth, they don't really care about the earth as much as the one who they're focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting question about heaven. Uh, are there different levels in heaven? Is there like a, 
uh, a foothill section of heaven for the really godly, middle class section for people that are all right, and then, you know, there's sort of the, the wrong side of the tracks. You're still in heaven, but, you know, you're, you're just not really experiencing the fullness of that that other people do. I think that last statement is more accurate than the levels of heaven. Uh, if we're describing places in which you're enjoying God's glory, that's not biblical. Heaven, by definition, is with Jesus. That, that is the most concise and direct description that is given as much to the least of the servants as to the greatest to follow Jesus' parable regarding him giving the uh, talent, or not the talent, the uh, denarius to the servants who worked late and those who worked the whole day. Right. But if, on the other hand, we're asking, will there be different levels of experience ways in which we'll be enjoying Jesus for eternity. The good news is there won't be envy or jealousy. Those things won't be a part of our character anymore. We'll be conformed to the image of Christ. We'll just be able to enjoy Him with whatever we have. Yeah. But there is a degree to which we're either in the First Corinthians 3 crowd, that the works of this life have been burned up and all we have is just Jesus, and there's also what are called the crowns of glory. Um, most of which, by the way, are just waiting for those who faithfully anticipate his return, which is becoming rarer and rarer. But note that point. Yeah. There's also those. Not as easy as we might think. Yeah, yeah. There's also those who have suffered martyrs' deaths. That is something that you will be given a crown for. There's also those who have served faithfully in ministries that you've been called to, not just pastorship, but any service to God. Uh, whatever you do, Colossians 3 style, do heartily as unto the Lord. Yeah. But the point then being made is this. This. What about the people who miss out on those crowns? They're with Jesus. They have heaven. What about the people who have the crowns? Well, we're told what people will be doing with them. In Revelation chapter 4, the 24 elders are casting their crowns before the throne and saying, and note the language is continual, yeah. so you get this really beautiful picture yeah. of Jesus giving them back the crowns and noting, I've entrusted you with this authority. And note, by the way, too, it's not going to be like some, you know, Ruby's Diner balancing act with many crowns in your head, like some sort of, <laughs> uh, like, you know, metal xylophone or whatever. It's making a point of authority being given to yeah. you. Some people look at Matthew 25 and say, you know, you've been faithful with little, I'll reward you over much. And that whole logic, I won't read too much into the parables because I'm not qualified, but the point then is, I think, most appropriate. There will be ways in which we'll enjoy Jesus more than others, but you're still with Jesus. That's heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the idea of levels of heaven comes from uh, a misinterpretation of uh, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12, where the Apostle Paul was talking about visions. He said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I don't know, God knows, how he is caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words in which it is not lawful for a man to utter. The idea of uh, the third heaven that's being mentioned there, you know, a lot of cult groups will make uh, hay about these sort of things, try to describe, you know, the different uh, tiers of heaven, if you will. But uh, the, the, the bottom line is uh, heaven has uh, three aspects, right, in the Bible. Yeah, the, the first heaven would be the first definition, the atmosphere, the sky, words flying in the midst of heaven. We see that used in Genesis 1. Right. The second is the heavens, plural, Genesis 1, 1, the universe, and then there's where God manifests his glory. That's what we mean by the third heaven. Yeah, so, uh, you know, some fantastic questions that we've had about it, some other great ones that we don't have time to get to, but we can certainly get to them if you'd like. Uh, can we get a message to someone in heaven. Can we to ask God to pass a message along? We'll finish with this. They're with Jesus. Pray to him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> God bless that, you. That's what they'd want you to do. So God, God bless, bless you. you. We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's word. One question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.